as we turn to the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, we read its first words and we get a leading indicator of what the book is about. There in Revelation 1, 1, story of story of Jesus, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. One of the things we learned from the very first sentence of the book of Revelation is that this book, contrary to current thought, is about Jesus. I was sitting in a restaurant close to Beverly Hills with some friends of my wife and myself, and we had launched out first time in COVID's history on the planet to actually go to a restaurant with someone else. To get into the restaurant, you had to show them your card that you had been that you'd either received one or two shots and that you had received a booster, otherwise you, you didn't get into the restaurant. Well, in our case, that's the case, and the other three people, that's their case. So we all got in, and as we were waiting for them, my wife and I were sitting around the table. We were saying, this is kind of, this is kind of strange, being in a public place with our mask off, sitting here. And we were talking about, after two years of the, the storm of COVID, how strange this felt what the risk it was. But then we said, well, everyone in here, everyone in here has got the card. They've, they've been boosted. Then my wife said, it doesn't matter. With, with Omicron, it bypasses it. I said, what, what, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? So as the uh, friends came, we were sitting around the table, and something very interesting emerged from a young adult that was around the table because we drifted onto discussions about the Adventist church, and the discussion went to uh, young adults and how they just are hitting the exit uh, door. And this young adult said, yeah, that revelation person said that the whole beast thing and all those images and all of that, no way. That has no relevance for today. And I thought to myself, as, as she was saying that, I was thinking about this verse. And I was thinking, the person does not know that the central piece of revelation are not all these symbols of beasts, etc., that are there, that is not the thrust. The ultimate theme and thrust is Jesus. And Jesus was absent from her assessment. And I knew at the table, she didn't know. It's all about Jesus. She didn't gesture any welcome for comment, so I kept it to myself, but I knew she didn't really understand the book of Revelation, because in the first verse, it says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John writes, the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, what must soon take place? It's the very first sentence. It's the revealing. The word used for revelation has to do with taking a, taking a cape off a piece of art and revealing it at the art show. It's Michelangelo making a, a, a statue chiseled out and pulling the cape off what's underneath so that you can actually see it and appreciate it. It's the revealing. 
from Jesus or of Jesus. And it also has to do with the present and the future. Now, the book of Revelation happens to be, by far, shouldn't scare us, but by far the most complicated book in the Bible. If we could use the analogy of music, when I was learning how to play the piano that didn't last long, there were very simple um, chords and notes to play, and usually they had to do with one hand, because when I graduated to two hands, that's when it was over. My mom pushed me off the piano bench when I was little, and I was so happy. She got frustrated, and I was frustrated before she was frustrated because it wasn't working in this, in this mind of mine. I don't have what you have. I don't. I can appreciate what you do. I don't understand how it happens. I can, I can appreciate music, but for me to do it, you don't want to hear it. So there's very simple music, just little notes, maybe a chord. But I've also seen the music that my... Um, my niece plays, who was working on a PhD in the viola, and she showed me some of the music she plays. And I don't understand it very much, but I saw an awful lot of notes. I saw notes and things I've never seen before with music and, and connectors with two lines and three lines on top, and notes had dots next to them. Some of them I don't think were all the way black, black, and they were on the top bar and the bottom bar. That's all I know. It was complicated. But when she played her viola, it was beautiful. Revelation is more like that kind of music than beginner music. It really, really is. However, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. And the Holy Spirit can take whatever it is and make it known to us so that we understand, so we can take action. That's the great hope. So as we turn to the book of Revelation, Jesus shows up, and then this promise immediately shows up. There's seven, we were studying this on Tuesday night, and, and Rudy, our elder, said, you know, the number seven is very significant in the book of Revelation. That's very, very true. There's seven blessings in the book of Revelation, and this is the seventh one. Or this is the first one. We're going to take a peek at the seventh one, too. But here it is. It says, uh, verse 3, <clears throat> Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Why? Because many of the early Christians were illiterate. They were illiterate. And so they would read in public, and they could get understanding. Blessed, are the, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. What do I learn from that? I learned that as we engage with the book of Revelation, God has stamped a blessing on it. All of us, could stand to be blessed from God. Amen? To be, blessed, to be blessed by God is to be in his favor. Um, to be blessed by God is to be like someone like Joseph, who God is revealing and using in his life. And so the book of Revelation starts out letting us know that as we begin this voyage, the book of Revelation, we will be blessed. I'm interested. I'm interested in that. I want God to bless me. I want to be blessed so I can bless others. Rudy shared his, during Sabbath school, at the very end, he shared the Bible teaching, he shared his family mission. My family mission is even simpler than his as a family, to be blessed, to bless others. To be blessed, to bless others. Here in the book of Revelation, verse 3, it says there's a blessing to read, to hear, take to heart, which I take as do. It's in your heart, do it. So Revelation starts out with a blessing, 
And then we find out originally who this was written to. We, as we look at this map, we see a little red or, or little green circle, and that's the island of Patmos. This is where John is. It's about 80, 95. He is the last, he was the youngest disciple. Now he's the last disciple. He's the oldest disciple now because everyone else has been eliminated. He's on this island as a punishment. He's on the island as a punishment for the word of God and his testimony to Jesus Christ, the gospel. That's why he's on this island. It's a painful thing to be old and to be away from your family. Not good. Being cut off. They had no cell phones. They had no internet. They had no um, communication forms like that. So he was totally cut off from his friends and his family on the island of Patmos. And <clears throat> the letter of Revelation is directed to seven churches. As you can see on this map, this is modern-day Turkey. Then it was called Asia. And there was a mail route that went, and it started in the seaside city of Ephesus. And this is the first church that will be mentioned in the book of Revelation in chapter 2 and 3, when it speaks about the seven churches. And then, and then the Revelation follows the mail route in the seven churches, and each one of these churches will show up until finally we get to the end of the book or of the churches, which is Laodicea. Seven churches in seven different conditions. This is who originally the book is written to. However, if we read verse 19, I don't have a slide for this. This gives us a hint of how we can read the book of Revelation. This particular verse right here is very significant to me because I was just a few miles away from here a number of years ago studying at Fuller Theological Seminary, studying in a class about teaching the Bible, and I had chosen the book of Revelation, and I was trying to understand the book of Revelation from the book itself, and I read this verse, and this verse did wonderful things for my thinking. In verse 19, it says, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now with the seven churches, what's going on in AD 95 in these seven churches. But in verse 19, it says, And what will take place later? Hint. Revelation is not just about back then. Revelation has a dimensionality to it that speaks through history and especially speaks to the end of time. Right? Do you believe that? Amen? It was about then, but God in his wisdom can also at the same time write about then, but he can write about the progression of history and he also can add to that special insight into the time of the end. That is one of the ways Revelation works. And then there's the address of actually who the book is from. And this is like an a, a introduction. This is like a greeting from the author of the book. John is just the penman. He's just the writer. He's just the inspired apostle. And so here we see who the book is from. Grace and peace. This is who it's from. Grace and peace from him who was and is and is to come. From the seven spirits before the throne and from Jesus Christ. We were studying this on Tuesday night and the number seven came up because the number seven comes up here. And so someone in our, our Tuesday night group said, well, well, this has to be the Holy Spirit because this is the Spirit, interpret the symbol, go back to Revelation where the number seven is first used. It's completion. It's rest. The only Spirit that makes us spiritually complete, that gives us rest, is the Holy Spirit. That sevenfold spirit goes to all seven of the churches. 
in what's going on in each church, as the Spirit can be everywhere at once today. I would suggest before to you that him who is, who was, and is to come is God the Father. We'll dive into that later in another sermon. And then lastly, it's from Jesus Christ. Now, because this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, there's an expansion of one of the three members of the Godhead, who this message is from. And the expansion, the 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 um uh, the blooming, the unfolding has to do with Jesus because in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, it says this. It talks about the qualifications of Jesus, and it says about Jesus three things about he, how he is qualified to be our Savior and our Lord. One, his first qualification. He is the faithful witness. The word witness comes from the root word, martyr. A martyr witnesses by giving up their life. It's the ultimate witness. I will give up my life, of which you want me to give away, I won't. And because I won't, what I'm holding on to is more valuable than my life itself. And so I will die holding on to it. And the faithful witness, Jesus is the faithful witness. He's the faithful witness. One to the Father. He's the faithful witness ultimately in his own martyrdom. This, of course, would refer to what great event in Jesus' life? What is associated with the martyrdom, the witness of Jesus? Isn't it the cross? The cross. Jesus' qualification, the cross. Two, the firstborn from the dead. Jesus didn't stay in the grave when he died, but he rose from the dead. He is alive. He is alive. Jesus is not, we know this, he is not just a theory. He's not just a word in the Bible. But we are speaking when we talk about Jesus and read about Jesus. This is real. I mean, I talked to him this morning. He's real. I read about him in the Bible, but he's real because I talk to him. You talk to him, right? You talk to him. Because he raised from the dead, he's got tremendous power. And then thirdly, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. Jesus is connected to what happens on the earth. We want to find out from the next three things that are said about Jesus, what kind of kings these are. Because Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He directs the kings of the earth. He's involved with the kings of the earth. We go on to the book of Revelation, and we read the very next verse. And now we have three actions that Jesus takes. They're wonderful actions. One, let's have someone read. Let's have someone read this. It's right in front of you, but let's have someone read this. Let's see here. Maria, will you read this just out loud? Just say it out loud to us. Yeah, right there. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. You can read it straight from your Bible. Let me come around. I'll put my hand over my mouth so you, I won't contaminate you. Let me come rule it all. <laughs> to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood um, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever. I can breathe again. Thank you for reading that. So here, Jesus' actions are the expression of continuous love. In the Greek tense, it's ongoing. It doesn't end. It starts and it keeps going. So it's ongoing love. Two, that there's, there's freed, being set free from sin by his blood. To me, if you've been set free from something, that sounds like victory to me. That sounds like deliverance and victory. And then thirdly, it speaks of that he 
He's made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve God. Now, if we put these two together, if we took Jesus' qualifications and we take Jesus' actions and we actually put them together side by side as they're shared in the book of Revelation, what do we find? We find, well, Jesus is the faithful witness. He's the faithful martyr. And what action is tied to that faithfulness of his witness? The content of his witness at Calvary is that he loves us in an ongoing, continuous, naughty or nice. He's not like Santa Claus. Santa Claus gives good gifts to the people that are good. I don't know what happens to the people that are bad. Jesus isn't like that. He loves us continually. He makes the sunshine that's shining overhead. It shines on all the people in Los Angeles. And I've got news for you. Not all the people in Los Angeles are good people. <laughs> not, all, not, all, not all the people in Los Angeles are seeking the ways of God. Let's just put it that way. They're not seeking God, but God makes his sunshine, the beauty of the day, the pristine air, the beauty of the mountains. It shines on the good and the evil. Because God loves us constantly and continuously. Calvary tells us this. He's the firstborn from the dead. Because Jesus died and he rose again, he has the power to free us from our sins by his blood. If we really reflect on this, we can begin to think about how we get snagged up into sin. Some of those ways we get snagged up into sin, we actually learn from our parents. Because it does say in the Old Testament that there's a generational pass down from the parents to three generations. Some of the tendencies we have, propensities they're called, are inherited from the flesh that we've come from. They're embedded into our life, into our nature. And through the resurrection power of Jesus, isn't this true? He wants to free us from those sins. Do you believe that? By freeing us from, by freeing us from those sins by his blood, he gives us, in place of the bondage, he gives us his victory. This is incredible, because if we're honest and we search our hearts, we cannot gain the victory over our evil propensities ourselves. The Holy Spirit will give us this awareness. If we seek it from God, the Holy Spirit will give us this awareness that we can't. Some people don't have this awareness. But as we come to know our own heart, we realize, I need Jesus. I need him. I need his resurrection power in my life because without him, I'm dead to sin. But by his blood, he can free me from my sins. Thirdly, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And notice here, we get a hint of what that means in terms of what kings those are, because it says that Jesus made us a kingdom and priests. So I would suggest to you that the kings that Jesus is directing on the earth are the rulers, the leaders in his kingdom on earth. Jesus is directly connected 
to leaders who are open to him to be guided by him in his kingdom on earth. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom of grace. There's a kingdom of glory that's coming when he will come again and we will enter into his physical kingdom. We will go to heaven. We will be there for a thousand years. We will return to the earth. Sin will be done away with. The world will be retreated. And on Sabbath, we'll go over to Reuben's house under the coconut tree. And knowing him, he'll probably have coconuts already broken open with a little bit of coconut juice in there for those of us that like it. And we'll sit around the coconut tree and we'll talk and share together. And it doesn't matter how long because time, time really has no bearing anymore because we will, <laughs> we'll have forever. I remember as a little kid trying to figure it because I was, I was raised in the Seventh Avenue Church, so this, this stuff filters into your head as a little kid. And I'd, I'd be down in the basement of my house and I'd try to figure out how long is forever. Then I'd get on this impossible thing to understand. God's forever in the past and God's forever in the future. I'd sit, I, I remember as a little boy with a butch, I, I, I'd turn this way and I'd try to look into the past as far as my imagination would go. And I would, say, and I would think to myself, but there's no end. So then I would try to imagine even further into the past. And I would imagine that in my mind. And I'd have to say to myself, because I believed it was true. God's before that. Then I'd give up. Then I'd give up. It made my head tired. Like people that go to college and they use their head a lot and their head gets tired. And they need a Sabbath rest to rest their brain from all the exercise during the week. That worked my little six-year-old brain out. Then I turn and face my bedroom the other way, and I go, well, maybe I can do it going forward. Maybe I can get God figured out going forward. So in my mind, my little mind, I try to picture how long is forever into the future? And I would look from what it says in the book of Revelation, the end of time, Jesus comes the second time, he awards people eternal life. He takes people to heaven. There's a thousand years in heaven. The new Jerusalem comes back to the earth. There's there's a great final event that occurs, and then then everything's made new. And and then past that, somehow I have my own home. Maybe it's next to Reuben's with with coconut trees growing. But at Greg's house, there's a, a tremendous amount of flowers around everywhere. And then I look past that, past that way past that, and I could never get to the end of it. Couldn't. I had to give up. Eternity's a long time. So we could spend all week over at Reuben's house just talking and sharing, eating coconuts underneath the tree. Isn't that right, Reuben? Will we be welcome? There, There we go. There we go. You see, here's the thing about Revelation. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. When we begin to study the book of Revelation, what begins to come into view, which does not come into view today, almost anywhere on this earth, on television it doesn't really show up, in the movies it doesn't show up, in most literature it doesn't show up, but in Revelation it does. In the book of Revelation, it pulls the curtain back, both on heaven and heaven's interaction with earth, people, you and me, but it also begins to reveal the ultimate reality of where we're going and headed into eternity with God. And there's not very many other places you hear about that. Isn't that true? It's all here and now. Revelation is the long view. And we need that today. There's a movement. There's a movement here between one to two to three. There's, there's some kind of progression that is, that is being given to us about Jesus. And this is the revelation of Jesus. And, and now as Jesus is introduced, there is a progression about him. This doesn't happen with the Father. It doesn't happen with the Son. It happens with Jesus 
And this book is about him, and there's a progression between one and two and three. There's movement. What's that movement about? I'd like to suggest to you that one dimensionality that comes into play big in the book of Revelation is this. Is the sanctuary. It's as if in the book of Revelation, someone is actually, through the symbols and the feasts embedded into the book of Revelation, one is actually traveling through the sanctuary service. That's not all. It's as if people are actually passing through the yearly cycle of the different gatherings of the children of Israel in the book of Revelation. We can look at that later, but now we just want to look at this little teeny bit. It's just a little tidbit. There's correlation between these three qualifications and actions with the sanctuary service and its three phases. One, number one, the faithful witness who loves us speaks to the, oh shoot, this is wonderful, speaks to the altar of burnt offerings. This is where the lamb was slain. This was the type that pointed forward to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. So in the book of Revelation, we immediately run into the faithful witness of the sacrifice that was made in the Old Testament on the altar of burnt offerings in the outer court. This is fulfilled when Jesus becomes the faithful witness on Calvary. This is the very first movement in God teaching the children of Israel who were slaves about himself. There would be sacrifice of a substitute that would be perfect, that would take all sins upon himself. God also revealed through the sanctuary phase two, here we go, the firstborn from the dead who freed us from sins by his blood. The Israelites in their, in their Old Testament experience would then, through the priest, enter into the holy place. Into the holy place was revealed not what Christ, Christ, what Christ has done for us. That was revealed here. God had bigger plans than just doing something for the children of Israel and for us. God's got bigger plans in the plan of salvation. What is that? Well, that has to do with the work of Christ in us. That has to do with him freeing us from our sins by his blood. How in the Old Testament did Jesus show the children of Israel he would do that for them? How would he come and be the abiding Christ, being Christ in us, the hope of glory? It was through the table of showbread, the Bible, the menorah, the seven lampstands of light, Holy Spirit, and the altar of incense, the incredible power of an intercessory high priest praying for us. We pray to him and he prays to the Father and we have full access and God's life and power comes into our life. And then lastly, of course, there was the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, the third phase came into play. The ruler of the kings of the earth, he's made us a kingdom and priest. Could it be there were two twin realities? Three. In the most holy place, the law and the mercy of God, the justice and mercy of God. We heard that prayed about this morning by you. Micah 6, verse 8. What does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. In the most holy place, we find ultimately 
what God wants revealed about himself in his kingdom on earth. What is it? It's Christ through us. Both from God ruling on his throne in heaven, God wants to reveal himself through us in his kingdom on earth. Through his priests. Who are his priests? Tuesday night we studied about this. Second, first, first Peter 2 verse 9, that we are a royal priesthood. Once we were not a people, but now we are the people of God. It's the Christian church. God's intention and plan is to make every single one of us a priest in his kingdom to reveal him through our life to other people. Some people don't buy this. Some people don't buy this here in this church. I got pushback on that. That's okay, because this is just the tip of the iceberg. The book of Revelation, is, if, if indeed themes of the book of Revelation about Jesus are being revealed here in, in acorn size, we're going to meet the oak of that acorn in the book of Revelation again and again and again. This is just the introduction. The work of Christ for us. The work of Christ in us. The work of Christ for us. Theological term, justification. Being declared righteous on behalf of the goodness of another, Jesus. Gospel. The work of Christ in us. As Paul says, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ bringing his victory into our struggle against ourself. And lastly, it takes a community. A person apparently can't do this alone, and God's never asked people to do this alone. That he's made us a kingdom. And in that kingdom... There are priests, and there are kings in that priest. There's leaders in that kingdom on earth, whereby as a people, God wants to reveal himself through word and testimony, the testimony of our life. Our life speaks a lot of words. Sometimes people can't hear us because our life is speaking much more to them than our words are. Would you, is that true? They can't hear us because our life speaks to them. And we say something, but a person goes, whoa, 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 hold the horse. You don't act like that's true in your life. And if I've got to pick one or the other, I'm not going to go by what you say because words are cheap. I'm going to go by what I see. And that's who you are and what you are. You see, we have to go through the plan of salvation. What Christ has done for us. What he's doing in us. He changes us. Then he can use us with our life, with other people to reveal what he's like. This was the whole plan. This was all planned out in the Old Testament. This Wasn't this the plan of the children of Israel in the Old Testament? God called a slave people. They weren't a people. They became a people. God works in a mighty way. Boom! He comes into Egypt through Moses. Ten plagues. Boom! He pulls them out. He reveals his mighty arm. Then he begins to show them. Moses up on the mountain. He gets the whole sanctuary plan. He gets the Ten Commandments. Moses comes down. His, his face is full of light. They, peep, they put the sack on his head. The light goes away. Moses reveals all, this, all, all of this to the children of Israel. He finds craftsmen, and, and now they do the second creation. They make it all. They make an enacted service of the plan of salvation that is dramatized and symbolized before them. The only trouble is, was, First covenant. It's the first covenant. God found, found fault with the people. Isn't it true? It says that in Hebrews. We're studying it 
Sabbath at 9.30 to 10.30 with great teachers. God found, God found fault with the people because they didn't do the one thing that God asked them to do. He only asked them to do one thing. Just do one thing. I will do all the rest. Do one thing. Just do one thing. Just do one thing. And God found fault in that one thing. And in the, new, and in the first covenant, God's promise, his agreement, God said, all you got to do, trust me. That's all you got to do. Trust me. Put your confidence all in me, and I will do it all in you. And the covenant was broken, and incredibly the stipulations of the, of the first covenant were if you break this covenant, they had the animals. Remember, they cut the animals in half and they put them on both sides and, and then there was a, a flaming torch that went through. Maybe you don't remember that, but that's what it was. And that was showing that when they made a covenant in the Old Testament, it was a blood covenant. Because they didn't, they didn't say, you know, if I break this covenant, you know, i got to pay you so much. Uh-uh. This kind of covenant they said they set up is that if I break my end of the covenant, I die. Like the animals that were cut in half, I die. And the God of what does the God of heaven do? What does the God of heaven do? The God of heaven steps in and he dies for the people who broke the covenant. It's incredible. It's God's grace. Then he makes the second covenant, or he renews the covenant with spiritual Israel. Anyone who wants to come become a part of him, Jew or Gentile alike. And it's the same terms. I will do it all. But trust me. Trust me. So God reenacts his plan a second time, but with a different people. And he goes worldwide. He wants to reveal what he's like to the world. It's the loud cry of the love of God for the world, the power of God, the kingdom of God. And I want to suggest to you that this is what the book of Revelation is about. You don't have to believe me because repeatedly we'll look at material in the book of Revelation and I will help integrate which one of these three pieces it fits into. How does this apply to you and me? One, we need to embrace the Savior and his love for us. No good just to hear it. We have to embrace Christ, our Savior. He's a wonderful Savior. Amen? Two, how does this apply to us? We need to surrender and take hold of what he, what he wants to do in us. And that is he wants to set us free. He really can. Set us free and give us his victory. Praise God he can. Praise God he, he can. Otherwise, we have no hope in this world. We just, repeat, we just keep repeating the same fault over and over and over again. Intervention. Christ's victory victory in our life. And thirdly, to unite as his kingdom and allow him to work through us, not through me, but through us, to reveal his glory to the world. That's how that applies to us. It becomes very important how we interact with one another as a community of believers here. And so, we end with a blessing. It's where we started. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart for what is written in it, because the time is near. Could it be, could it be that this is the very thing God wants to do with us.
And so the time is at hand. The time is now. The time is near. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you that we can be here today. Thank you for your book in the Bible that it was written so long ago, but speaks to us today. And thank you for your great plan of salvation and that we can be included in that plan. And that plan will not fail. Take the faith that you've given to us as we return it to you to embrace you, to believe in you, to rejoice in you, to praise you, to share you. Bless us, Lord. Do your promise. Bless us. Christ for us. Bless us, Lord. Christ in us. Bless us, Lord. Christ working through us. In Jesus' name, amen. to stand as we uh, go with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, in these moments, we're reminded that this earth is momentary. There's something more than just this life. That this life is only a beginning and those of us that are older know that time fleeds through our fingers like sand. And we find ourselves wondering, where did it all go? I was just a little kid a little while ago. Time moves so fast. But today, we're thankful that this life is only the beginning. There's an eternity that stands before us. And Jesus himself is the way, the truth, 
and the life. That no one comes to the Father but through him. But that's who we come to through him. And we're reminded of the music that we've heard that there is an abounding grace. There is an abounding mercy. As John himself says in his gospel, there is grace upon grace. To receive grace once is only the beginning, but to receive grace upon grace upon grace. Lord, grace our life. Bless our life. Empower our life. Your promise, Lord, we claim that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not grow faint. We've waited before you in your word. We've read it aloud. We've heard it. Place it in our heart. And then enact it in our life through the Holy Spirit. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. Because you are the true God. You are the most wonderful God that there ever could be. And your promise is we will spend eternity with you because of Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen.